For those of us who live below sea level in South Louisiana, even a small tropical storm can trigger flooding like this. Very surprised. Uh, really, everybody thought it was going to be a blow of a night type of situation. It turned out to be pretty much like a lucrative hurricane, I would believe. Tropical Storm Lee was the latest reminder of the flooding rains that can stop us in our tracks and the winds that can push water into low-lying coastal areas. With two storms popping up before the season even began this year, what are we in for? How prepared are our local levee systems? And what steps can you and your family take to be prepared for whatever comes our way? From Channel 4's Eyewitness News, Eye on Hurricanes 2012 with Dennis Woltering, Angela Hill, and Chief Meteorologist Carl Arredondo. Tropical Storm Lee last summer brought all of us a reminder that we remain vulnerable to even the smallest tropical system. It may not be wind, but flooding rains that cause problems. And as we've seen in the worst cases, it's both. And it only takes one storm to test our plans, which brings us to the predictions of just what we can expect this season. Meteorologist Laura Bucktail has that. As we start this 2012 hurricane season, we always like to look at the different predictions across the board. And this year, we are expecting a weaker season, less active season across the Atlantic Basin. NOAA is saying between 9 and 15 named storms. Dr. Gray at Colorado State University also saying about 10 named storms right within that range. We're saying four to eight hurricanes from NOAA, four of those Dr. Gray saying becoming hurricanes, and one to three major hurricanes. So a range kind of on the small end past couple of seasons have been fairly active. For example, last year, 18 named storms in the Atlantic Basin. So why a less active season this year? Well, if you look out into the Pacific Coast, right off the coast of South America, we are looking at neutral conditions forming near normal water temperatures. You may notice we talk about La Nina or El Nino each year. Well, when we are in the middle, we don't have warmer or cooler water. We just call it neutral conditions, and that can lead to several weakening factors across the Atlantic Basin. First of all, we're still expecting low wind shear across the Caribbean. So storms that develop, we're expecting them to not encounter a lot of that wind shear there across the Caribbean Sea. Now, if you look out into the northern Atlantic, sea pressures this year are expected to be higher than normal. Higher sea pressures keep development from occurring across the Atlantic Ocean. That would be good news for us. And then a little bit farther to the south where these storms develop in the Atlantic, sea surface temperatures this year are a little closer to average. And remember, sea surface temperatures, seawater, that's the fuel that instigate those hurricanes. And with near normal temperatures, we're not expecting as strong of storms. Now, as far as the risk of a hurricane across the coastline, we do break it down for you. The Gulf Coast, about a 49% chance of a hurricane crossing that coastline. Goes up a little bit for the East Coast, 51%. That's from Florida all the way up to Maine. And so we still are expecting the possibility, at least, of some form of hurricane crossing the U.S. coastline, about a 75% chance for the entire coast. Now, with these early storms that we've had this year, of course, now we've had Alberto and Beryl, what does that mean for the rest of the season? Will it be more active than normal? Well, keep in mind, this is a neutral year. No El Nino or La Nina developing. And when I looked back at some other early start years, one of those, 1908, that was the last year that we had two early named storms and look at this, the season was below average. Only nine total storms formed in 1908. When you look back in 1970, we had Hurricane Alma develop before June 1st. So an early start there, but the whole season, only 10 named storms. So we are expecting a less active season this year. For Eye on Hurricanes, I'm meteorologist Laura Bachtel. When we talk about the strength of hurricanes, we use the familiar category numbers based on the Saffir Simpson scale. This year, the Hurricane Center has made some changes to the way it will classify storms. Meteorologist Jonathan Myers looks at what it means for those of us along the Gulf Coast. Since the 1960s and 70s, the Saffir Simpson scale has judged the size of a hurricane's storm surge solely on the strength of its winds. The stronger a storm, the bigger and more destructive its surge. But then in 2004, Hurricane Charlie raced through southwest Florida. It was a Category 4, but only brought the swell of a Category 3. Next season, Hurricane Katrina slammed southeastern Louisiana. It was a Category 3, 
but delivered the devastating surge of a Category 4. Three years later, Hurricane Ike slammed into Texas. It was just a Category 2, but it too swamped the coast with a massive Category 4 surge. Three storms, three mismatched categories. Basing storm surge on winds just wasn't working. As far as storm surge is concerned, the bottom line is it's a lot, it's a very complicated uh, uh, issue to discuss. And it's not just strictly dependent on the, the intensity or strength of a hurricane. There are other complicating factors. And in 2011, the rocky relationship between storm surge and the Saffir Simpson scale finally came to a long needed close. So there was a, a concerted effort uh, to uh, alleviate this confusion uh, and also to be more scientific, give the Stafford Simpson scale some more credibility and scientific integrity by divorcing the more complicated issue of storm surge from the Stafford Simpson categories. Uh, Today, meteorologists use computer models that analyze a storm's size, its forward speed, and its angle of approach when forecasting storm surge. They even take into account the complexities of the coastline both under and above the water. Storm surge models are so intricate that they take into account features like local railroad tracks with the idea that these areas of elevated land could protect your home. When a hurricane approaches, forecasters of the National Weather Service and National Hurricane Center feed the information from the computer models into easy-to-read, color-coded graphics that you can find at home on the web. So this is an example of the storm surge impact. Threat levels, as I said before, are, have been designed for southeast Louisiana. In addition to shifting how storm surge was presented last season, the National Hurricane Center has also made some changes to the Saffir Simpson wind scale this season. The top end of Category 3 is now at 129 miles an hour instead of 130 miles an hour. Category 4 ranges from 130 miles an hour up to 156 miles an hour. And Category 5 now starts one mile an hour higher at 157 miles an hour. These minute adjustments are simply a correction on a long-used mathematical conversion. But what still affects us most are the complexities of storm surge and our very complicated coastline. And they, all those factors come into play here and in other locations. Our location, because it's low-lying, because of its unique layout, so to speak, uh, these factors have a way of combining and magnifying the storm surge threat for our area. So with a little knowledge of your elevation, and a lot of preparation for what may come. In just a click of a mouse, you'll be well on your way to keeping you, your property, and your family safe. For Ion Hurricanes 2012, I'm meteorologist Jonathan Myers. Next, a look at the critical issue of flood protection as we head into this hurricane season. And later, Derek Kevra has some must-have apps that can help you stay prepared and in touch with new technology. The Corps of Engineers and local levy authorities say that our area is more protected than ever from hurricanes and flooding, but there remain some areas of concern as we head into this hurricane season. With us now for a progress report are Tom Podani, the Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Protection and Restoration Office, Susan McClay, President of the Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Authority West, and Tim Duty, President of the Southeast Flood, Louisiana Flood Protection Authority East. And thank you all for coming in, I appreciate it. First, Tom, let's start with you. How would you describe the, the serious, the major improvements since last season? There's been a lot of great progress since last year. Um, as you might recall that last year we had measures to, to defend against 100 year probability of flooding. Um, we uh, had about 95% of the permanent work completed. We've done, along with the levy districts and levy boards in the state, made a lot of progress in, in uh, raising levees and strengthening levees and flood walls and, and uh, completing or seeing uh, coming close to completion on, on a lot of the surge barriers. So I think uh, right now we're at a, at, a, at a point where greater than 99% mm -hmm. of the permanent work is completed and we only have a few spots where we continue to put engineered interim uh, closures in or engineered construction closures uh, to address uh, 
uh, potential gaps that we might have to leave in for access for construction equipment or for vehicle access. The goal is 100 year protection. How close are we to that right now? Well, we do have measures to defend against the 100 year uh, as we did last year now. It's just that all the permanent work isn't completed, mm -hmm. but we expect that most of it will be done this year. There are a few contracts that we will have uh, completing in 2013, but of the 110 uh, contracts that we have for the 100 year work, uh, most of those are complete this year. Susan, on the West Bank, what, what major improvements have taken place in the past year? Oh my goodness, Dennis, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, the east side of the Harvey Canal, the wall is done. I mean, we, you know, we haven't accepted it yet, but it is for all practical intents and purposes done or completed. Um, the other area that was of concern was the Western Closure Complex, the enormous sector gate. Uh, I think last year in mid-season we were going to, or the Corps was going to have to close it with a tugboat. Mm -hmm. Now you The pumps the weren't ready yet. The gates closed, the pumps have been tested, so that's all done, completed uh, functionally to defend against the 100-year. Then uh, we have the Eastern Tie-In Closure, which again I've told by July that that involves some gates that we'll have to close on Highway 23. Those will be operable, and again, Tom, if I'm incorrect, jump in, but I'm understanding July, that'll be completed. That's Highway 23 in Plaquemines. Highway 23 in Plaquemines in the Oakville area. Then out on the eastern, or the western tie-in, rather, in uh, St. Charles Parish around AMA, that uh, will not be done this year. Uh, you know, it's, it's making great progress, but that's the, probably about the only area we would have to use the engineering measures that Tom uh, mentioned about, and that would be closing about 70 feet with HESCO baskets. All right, and Tim, on the East Bank, where what major improvements have been made? Well, the most significant improvements are in the, uh, the Seabrook structure is now closed. It's in a closed position, and it's not complete, but it's nearly complete. And uh, the surge barrier is in a closed position, but not yet complete. Both those, are, those are the biggest improvements Describe us. the surge barrier and what that, what the importance of that. The surge barrier is a 1.8 mile structure that rises above the water by about 25 feet that protects the entire metropolitan New Orleans area from the surge thrown up by storms from the Gulf of Mexico and from Lake Bourne area. Um, and the Seabrook structure protects the IHNC area uh, from the lake, rising water in the lake. But those two are huge improvements for us. And, and what about the causeway bridge construction? That's something that's been underway this past season. Yeah, and that, there are two notable uh, sections that are still going to be open. Uh, one of those is the causeway and the Duncan pump station. But those are going to have engineered measures to close them. And like Tom said earlier, those are open to allow for construction. All right. Thank you all for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dennis. Thank you. St. Tammany Parish plans to fight the effects of any flooding this season with new technology to help homeowners protect their homes. Automated sandbag machines that can fill and seal 740 sandbags an hour. Doug Mouton shows us how it works. Even during Tropical Storm Lee last year, certainly not what you would call a major event, hundreds of people filled up sandbags to protect their homes, a cumbersome, difficult process. The parish also bagged sand for people with a process that looked like this, conveyor belts on dump trucks, then hand-tied bags. Now that process is much easier, St. Tammany leaders say, with this. They're a little bit faster, a little bit less labor intensive, but much more efficient. The parish invested $240,000 in automated sandbag machines, which St. Tammany leaders say will get plenty of use. Maybe the biggest improvement this system offers is the way the bags are clamped. They're sealed much tighter, no more hand sealing. So these bags are now more reliable. The new automated machines will be spread out across the parish because in major events, sandbags are needed across all of Southern St. Tammany. And we want everyone to know that we are prepared. We want them to be prepared. And you know, the further we get away from Katrina and no more storms, we kind of relax a little more. We're still in danger when a hurricane comes, so don't take anything for granted, but we surely wanted to start it off with this new equipment because we're really proud of it. For Eye on Hurricanes 2012, I'm Doug Mouton. Technology doesn't only help forecasters track storms, it can also help you stay up to date and informed. Next, Derek Kevra has some of the apps you'll want to have on your smartphone this season. Preparing for and responding to an emergency can be overwhelming, but technology can help. 
Meteorologist Derek Kever joins us now with a few must have apps for this season. There are two things that I always have in my pocket, chapstick and my cell phone. But in this day and age, it's the cell phone that is most useful and convenient. So when you're getting prepared for hurricane season this year, remember, there's probably an app for that. Emergency personnel will Emergency personnel will tell you it's important to have a plan in place before a disaster hits. An app called Emergency Preparedness Checklist for the iPhone and Android allows you to do just that. It helps you create an emergency plan by setting a reunion location for all members of your family. And it takes you through a checklist for a disaster, giving you tips to prepare. Things like show family members how to turn off water, gas, and electricity. The app also reminds you to place all your financial and personal documents in a waterproof container. Good advice indeed, but grabbing those documents isn't always practical in the middle of a crisis. That's why apps like Genius iPhone Scan for the iPhone and Document Scanner for the Android are useful. You take a picture of an important document, convert it to a JPEG or PDF, and can immediately email it to yourself or place it in a safe online storage site. During the disaster, though, things that you need are a little different. Apps like Flashlight for iPhone or Android turn your phone into a flashlight. SOS by the Red Cross is an app for emergency care information. It has video explainers from Dr. Oz on how to administer CPR and treat broken bones. Go ahead and bookmark this link on your cell phone's web browser. It's Entergy's interactive map showing power outages in southeast Louisiana. So if you look at it, you see any of the lines that are green, that means the power is on. If it's in red, that means the power is off. And it's great in the event of a hurricane or an, or an emergency if you were to evacuate and you want to check to see if the power is back on your neighborhood. Of course, all these apps are predicated on the fact that you can get service, which, during a disaster, can be a concern. However, newly improved cell on light trucks, or Colts, should help with that. Colts are really just portable cell phone towers that are brought in during a disaster when call volume goes up. We've upgraded them all to our 4G LTE network that we are deploying nationally. We've got two thirds of the, the country covered and many of our customers now use 4G and enjoy the speeds of 4G. When it comes to the specific details of the storm, where it is, where it's going, there is the WWL TV weather app. Our app not only has current info and model projections, but also Twitter feeds from local parish offices, the National Hurricane Center, and the WWL weather team. This, combined with contraflow maps and video explanations, makes it a must-have during this hurricane season. One final piece of advice. Always make sure your gadgets are fully charged. When you're in an emergency, you never know the next time when you're going to be able to get a little more juice. Thank you, Derek. And our website also has lots of hurricane information and emergency resources as we head into the season. We have maps, satellite images, and radar views of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf region. You can also download this year's hurricane guide and find links to the local parish websites. And if a major storm does threaten, we'll stream our continuous coverage online as well. So you can watch from your computer if you evacuate out of town. When we return, a look at how local parishes are getting prepared this hurricane season. And some important phone numbers and websites you'll want to write down as part of your emergency plan. Local emergency managers say they're continuously updating and fine-tuning their plans for hurricane season, and they urge all of us to do the same. One valuable exercise for local first responders came just before the start of hurricane season. Firefighters from Orleans, Jefferson, and St. Tammany joined with the Coast Guard and even the Louisiana SPCA for rescue exercises. To some, it recreated the challenges during Hurricane Katrina and the medical and emergency situations that first responders face during a catastrophic event. It's important for all of us to have a plan for evacuating when a storm threatens. That's especially important if you have special medical needs or no transportation. In Orleans Parish, you should pre-register for help by dialing 311. You can also sign up for emergency alerts on your computer or cell phone by logging on to ready.nola.gov. In Jefferson Parish, call 349-5360 or log on to jeffparish.net. Businesses should also sign up now for re-entry placards to speed up their recovery after a storm. 
If you live in another parish and will need help evacuating in the event of a storm threat, Sally Ann Roberts has the information you'll need to know about signing up early for help. In a moment, we're going to run through the numbers you'll want to call if you need help evacuating this hurricane season. In St. Bernard Parish, residents with special needs should call 278-4322 or 278-4286 to pre-register for help. Residents can also sign up to be notified in the event of an emergency by calling those same numbers. In Plaquemines Parish, the number to call is 394-3510 to sign up for help. You can also contact the Office of emergency preparedness with any questions at this number 274-2477. St. Tammany residents with special needs should call 985-898-3074. In Tangipahoe Parish the number is 985-748-3211 and in Washington Parish call 985-839-0434. In Lafouche Parish, you should call 985-537-7603 if you'll need help evacuating during a storm. And in Terrebonne, the number to call is 985-868-8411. For St. Charles Parish residents, special needs or elderly residents should call 985-783-5050. And in St. John the Baptist Parish, the number to call is 985-479-0272. We'll also have all of this information posted on our website, www.tv.com. Remember, now is the time for you to make sure that you and your family have an emergency plan. We hope we won't need it, but it's crucial to be prepared for anything that may come our way. For Eye on Hurricanes 2012, I'm Sally Ann Roberts. As always, you can count on WWL-TV and WWL-TV.com to be there in the event of any weather threats this storm season. It's what we mean when we say we're keeping our eye on hurricanes. Thanks for joining us.